Yeah, that sure was ugly, but uh, I guess on the bright side, it was against uh, the best team on the schedule. So there are four or five opponents lined up here next that Nebraska certainly should be able to compete with. So better measuring sticks are to come. Welcome to Huskers Live here at the Voice of College Football. We do this each and every Tuesday with you, 7 o'clock Eastern, 6 o'clock where it counts. Greg Peterson, of course, as always, Husker Online. Catch his work right there. Justin Adams, post-game show host here at the Voice of College Football, right here on the Nebraska channel. Yes, sir. Hey, guys. How's it going? Hi, fellas. Greg, what's going on tonight? Not a whole lot. <laughs> What happened on Saturday, Greg? Weekend. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did, what did happen over the weekend? <laughs> that was nasty, ugly. And it was. Didn't show up to play. And uh, yeah, it was not a good situation all the way around for the Huskers. Yep. Yeah, I didn't expect a seriously competitive game, but I did not expect that. So right at the time when Heinrich Harburg was stopped on that fourth down when it was 14 to nothing after they had driven the ball 60, 65 yards, that was, I thought, where, okay, even in the moment, I thought, I don't know that this is going to be a game now. I think that was their shot. Okay, 14-7, crowds back in the game. Here we go. That seemed like that was pretty much what took it out of them. Yep. Absolutely. I feel like, I feel like the energy was gone after even that tipped pass interception. I feel like right when we got that second pass intercepted, we kind of knew what was coming. I I, I mean, for, for me, the stadium for a big game, it felt a little dead from the start in comparison to what I normally, you know, last year went to the Oklahoma game, went to the Ohio State game where game day was there a couple years back. And those games were a lot louder at the beginning. So just seems like there was a lot of um, nervous energy in the crowd to begin with. But, uh, yeah, as soon as it was 14-0, basically, I brought my girls her first game. So I basically already started apologizing to her for bringing her to this game because <laughs> I, I told her it was over from there. Once once they scored that second touchdown, I basically knew it was over because we, we had to play damn near perfect to even have a shot to beat them. To even have a chance to beat them, we had to play a perfect game. And even then it would have been tough. So... Yeah, I had to agonize down there on the sideline, not shooting anything after about that time. Yeah, <laughs> I just yeah. put my camera down and just hung out. Yeah, I was. It was. That was rough. I was like, give them. I'll cheer for them. They give me something to cheer for because they just came out so flat. And I mean, Michigan. Credit to Michigan, man. That that is a very tough team. That team is extremely well disciplined, extremely well coached, and they do what they do very, very well. So we couldn't get a push on them all day. And, yeah, like you said, that Harburg, fourth and one, first thing I said was, why are we in shotgun? Our line's not getting a push on their line. Why would we give them more of a shot to push into our backfield? I think we needed to go Harburg under center and just, you know, have him get low and push, drive forward for that yard. But, yeah, it was it was definitely over for that. Yeah, you see it more and more. Of course, the quarterback sneak. I don't remember how – Distance, what the distance was. Fourth and two. Oh, fourth and two. Oh, yeah. was it two? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was a it was a long yeah, it was it was like a yard and a half ish. Yeah. But shotgun wasn't. I just with 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 seeing how their line was pushing back our old line, it's just there was no shot that I, I a shotgun play was gonna work. Our best chance was getting under center and just trying to really just drive, um, maybe get a push. But because, yeah, that's the way to go at a certain distance. I'm not going to yeah. judge a yard and a half to two yards. Mm. That's mm -hmm. a ways to push uh, the Michigan defensive front out of the way. But, uh, yeah, now that you can push these uh, players forward and get as many guys behind them. Yeah, Bush push them. Yep. Mm -hmm. That was what I was thinking. Just have Harburg just kind of push that big frame forward, you know, get them long arms extended and get somebody to push them over and just get it fall down but yeah that one didn't go very well well let's take this one from the top greg with uh passing game where would you go in that direction with uh kind of limited down to this game and going forward well you're obviously limited with your weapons 
And, uh, you know, without being able to run consistently, then the passing game suffered, obviously. And, I mean, what you had like uh, 40-some snaps on offense. So, you know, you, you don't have a lot of, a lot of plays, which is unfortunate. But, uh, you know, I, I mean, Heinrich Harburg didn't play bad. Mm-mm. I mean, you know, he's doing what he can out there. And, you know, unfortunately, the defense missed a lot of assignments that ended up being scores for Michigan. And, you know, they're, they're, Nebraska is a, a defensive team. They're not built to come back from being behind. And, uh, you know, you see that because it takes the running game out. I mean, when Anthony Grant only gets six carries, you know, to kind of pull the plug on the rushing game. So, you know, it was, it was just they were overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, just blatantly shows how far they have to go to compete at that high of a level. Yeah. I think that the biggest disappointment was just like, you know, at, at least in one of these big games, um, you'd like to see some kind of fight. I just feel like, you know, in a well, lot of these close home games um, in recent years, we're not really outside of Michigan a couple of years ago, but it's tough sledding. And we're not in, we're not even remotely in a lot of these games, even by halftime. And I think that's part of the frustration is, you know, by no means did I expect to beat Michigan but I would have loved to see a fight. Um, and then maybe if they pull away, in th- uh, you know, late in the third, fourth quarter, but they, I mean, like we said, that game was over with seven minutes in the first quarter. <clears throat> I mean, Matt Rule was pissed. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, he showed up, fired up. He, you know, they, they went in and practiced in full pads on Sunday. Yeah. And went after it. Good against good the whole time and competed. And, to a, to a T, every single coach and player has never had a full padded practice in their mm-hmm. in their careers after a game. So, yep, you know, this is totally unacceptable. But the good news is, like you mentioned, there's seven games left, yep. all against unranked teams right now, which would be is the first time since Nebraska joined the Big Ten that. Um, they will face seven straight unranked teams. Now that could change, obviously, yeah. but um, obviously you still have a, a, a pretty good path in front of you that you know you can fix things and uh, you can still <laughs> get your goal of making a bowl game. And it starts on Friday night. Yeah, I, um, you know, one of the things that uh, is is the big indicator for me is like people were kind of just you know. I think still a little overreactive to the Michigan loss because, again, coming into the season, nobody really gave us a chance in that game. So I don't know why this changes anything in anybody's opinion or anybody's mind about um, rule or anything because, in my eyes, the the biggest indicator of future success and where this team's going is how they respond in this next week um, against Illinois. Um, you know, we, we had that performance. There's nothing we can do about that, but – this team's ability to battle back and see how they come out and, and they play, you know, that first half of the next game coming off of that, I think that's going to show a lot about the grit of this team and and uh, kind of give us an indicator of what Rule is kind of doing with them to get them prepared coming off of these big losses and getting their energy and their motivation back. <clears throat> yeah, so... Uh... I would say that's a fairly typical way to respond for a head coach uh, in in terms of we've heard this before. You get whipped on the field and they're going to take it out on the players and basically say, we need to we need to work harder. Yeah, we need to you know, take this more seriously or correct the issues we've been having. And the Mm -hmm. best way to do that is get out there and practice harder. So obviously that's, uh, as Greg has uh, outlined, has been the response. Yeah, and Coach Rule just wants the guys to play. Stop being worried about losing. You know, just get after it. Go play. Go, yeah. go play free and, and uh, you know, manage your assignment. Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of missed assignments, like I mentioned on defense, that led to scores for Michigan. Yeah. 
mean, you know, their, their longest their longest score was a 29 yarder, and um, you know, one of the guys went completely the wrong way, and sure enough, where do you think the ball went through? Yep. You know, and wound up being a 29 yard touchdown run. So mm-hmm. um, those kind of mistakes just they can't happen. Yeah. I think the biggest response I'm looking for is just on the field Friday, um, seeing how they come out, you know, even on a short week, just um, what that first quarter looks like. You know, do they have that fire? Um, do they have that tenacity? Because I, I think that's what we haven't seen in the previous years is just responding um, with energy. Um, it's been more so like, you know, we kind of we come off a tough loss and then we go into another game. And we're just kind of sleepwalking through it. Um, I, I hope to see them come out and I think they will come out with a lot of fire and intensity Friday and um, you know, bowl game still on the table. Six wins is still on the table um, just because a lot of the future games that are scheduled are looking a little bit easier. You know, Iowa losing their quarterback. So, and then Illinois losing to Purdue about as bad as we lost to Michigan. So it's one of those things. It's like, as long as they I'd, um, <laughs> go ahead, sorry. I'd back off on that statement just a bit. All right. Well, yeah. I mean, it makes me feel better just a little bit. Okay. But then, yeah, when it was all said and done, the final score, but uh, they they had a they had a lead going into the third quarter. Yeah, so. just looking at the looking at the final. Yeah, yeah and, and unfortunately for Nebraska, you know, they lost Deshaun Singleton very yeah. early in the game, and Phelan Sanford, I think, is and Luke Luke Reimer was a was a scratch because he got ill suddenly and is dealing with um, non-football related injury right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, they did get out of the hospital. So you're missing, you know, Cam Linhart obviously been hurt too. So you're missing three of your top 11 defensive guys, yeah. um, which, you know, kind of had to change things around and, you know, just relying on other guys to come in there and pick up the slack, which also caused Tommy Hill to have to uh, play both ways. Yeah. Um, for basically the whole game, and um, yeah, it just you know was an unfortunate uh, kind of starting disaster before kickoff even started. Yeah, we got a Josh Fleeks sighting though. That was good. <clears throat> Josh Fleeks is looking like he'll be the number two on the dip chart. Yep. Um, and then I think it was what Phelan Sanford's going to move into the jack spot. Yeah, he's uh, he's taking over for Deshaun right now. Yep. yep. Yeah, that play happened so late. I didn't even see it. The seventy-four yard touchdown out of Fleeks. So, how did that come together? It's a quick run up the middle, and just the hole opened up, and he was just basically gone. As soon as he hit the second level, there was nobody around him. Um, Marcus Washington had a uh, a block late down the field, just as a frustration block. That was another thing too. Mark uh, Marcus Washington, if if Harburg would have hit him in stride on one of those throws. Probably would have had a touchdown, another touchdown there a little bit earlier in the game. So missed opportunities. And then, um, yeah, that Fleeks, that Fleeks run, though, I mean, he looked fast in that. And it just, you know, it, partially it's hard to judge it too much because the game was pretty much put away at that point. So, you know, Michigan probably, you know, kind of let off the gas. But still, uh, Fleeks is one of those guys that we have been excited about. And his upside's, you know, tremendous. So I'm hoping we get to see a lot more of him at running back. I don't think they did step off the gas because Matt Rule even said he thanked Jim Harbaugh after the game for letting us play. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that, that is a good point. Yeah, I'd um I had um Just tried not to take anything away from Josh Fleek's run. I mean Yeah. You know he was a he was a high school running back and um you know they put him at wide receiver when he went to Baylor Rule mm-hmm. did. Um but no, he's shown that he can be very capable, of, you know, playing out of the backfield. So, yep, he's can't definitely going to get more run coming up here. Can't be mad at seventy-four yards per carry. Not bad. So, <laughs> yeah, he would probably say, you know, to shut him down at this point, and he's going <laughs> to set an all-time record. Yeah, <laughs> he's going to declare for the draft. But that was um that was exciting to see because because we need well, yeah, we need six year senior so I mean yeah. <laughs> we need we needed uh we he needed some, like, <laughs> we needed some excitement out of that out of that running back room um or just something to kind of inspire some confidence just because yeah I mean 
Grant, like the running game was pretty much. It wasn't like you couldn't you could not evaluate running backs out of that game. Absolutely not. No, it was just Michigan's. I mean, their defensive line is tough. They that that defensive game plan was was schemed up perfectly. Um, offensively, they just got real big and heavy sets and just, you know, basically made it look easy. Whether they wanted to pass or throw, they did what they wanted, and we couldn't get anything. It seemed like one, two yards at a time was even tough to get a lot of the times. Fumbled snaps and, you know, they that punt that hit their hands and they're able to pick it up and they got a lane to the left there for 40 yards. Just seems like nothing went Nebraska's way. And on top of that, they got outplayed completely. So, <clears throat> yeah, it did not look pretty. Now, the, the seven opponents coming up, as Greg mentioned, they are all what I would consider to be beatable. Now, of course, Wisconsin is probably the best team. Mm -hmm. We got we got to see a lot of football before, at least I can make a determination on that. But based on what we knew going into the season, and they haven't really done much to back away from that, yeah. uh, as you mentioned, Justin. Cade McNamara on the shelf for the rest of the season at Iowa. So they're going with a former Wisconsin backup, Deacon Hill, who break. <clears throat> they hit 11 of 27 the other night, but uh, there were a lot of drops involved. Yeah. But Iowa's going to be Iowa, and they won a game the way they win games. They were losing in the fourth quarter, and they had a punt return for a touchdown with four minutes left. And you're probably not going to score on them in the last four minutes when they're protecting a lead. So that's yep. how they do it. Special teams, defense. There you go. But uh, on the on the flip side, Nebraska, if they're not motivated, focused, improving, they can lose to all these teams, too. Absolutely. Yeah. That's the thing, too, is like, you know, I don't even feel confident saying like these games are like, you know, even calling them winnable. It's like I just want to take it a game at a time and just let them show, you know, how they that they can actually string a couple of these wins together and then we can start getting more confidence, I think, in the fact that this team can come out and consistently perform even against teams they should beat. Because, again, in the past, a lot of teams we've played have been beatable and we haven't been beating them. So um, this is a new year and stuff like that, but still you want to see a couple couple of those wins in a row just to get a little bit of confidence back. But as soon as as soon as we, you know, come off, string a couple wins together, it's, you know, the fan base is going to be right back picking up where they left off and then we're going to see that, Five, six wins is still on the table. Bowl game still on the table. It's still in front of us. Everything we want is still in front of us. This Michigan game didn't really change anything. It was just disappointing how it turned out and how bad the loss was. But it really, in the grand scheme of things, doesn't change anything going forward because nobody really pegged us winning this game. <clears throat> Although the Minnesota and Colorado games were at least to start the season in that category of – yeah possible wins mm -hmm. yeah but and um the the thing about those two weeks that just because before we were kind of like in the camp of uh five to seven um but i think a lot of just these later games got a lot easier um quote unquote easier looking on the schedule based on how some of those teams have played um so far absolutely so jackson we will go ahead and turn the page to Illinois on not Saturday, folks. If you've not been keeping track, uh, check that schedule a little bit closer. <clears throat> Friday game coming up this week. So Nebraska is going to have the national spotlight and want to show out against uh, the Illini of Illinois coming off a rough 44-19 loss to Purdue. I don't know how much of a national spotlight FS1 is. <laughs> <laughs> I will check the cable numbers to see what how many subscribers they get. I don't know what that is. Yes, Greg's bringing us back to reality. I was going to give them the national spotlight for Friday night. Well, Illinois and uh, Louisville's probably playing somebody too. <laughs> yeah, I think there is another game. I'll have to give that a look. But uh, we've got uh, Sonny Verma checking in from the Illini cast to talk some Illinois football. Sonny, how you doing tonight? You know, I'm doing okay. We actually just uh, finished our recording our Nebraska preview, and at the end of the episode, we're like, man, this episode was depressed, depressing. This was very somber. 
And then I we conclude that and I log into here and I'm watching this one. I'm like, wow, we really are mirror images of each other. Because <laughs> there's there's a lack of energy coming from you guys and us. It's just kind of a story of where Illinois and Nebraska football are this season. You ain't kidding. That's that's uh, pretty much it right there. We're going to have to pick things up so we could uh, make it a double downer of sorts. Yeah, between <laughs> the, the two fan bases here, but we don't need to do that. Uh, you know, there's always next week and um, both teams want to get to postseason play and it's still on the table and both teams are at two and three. So this is going to be uh, I got to think for each team and for each fan base, they're looking at the other as we need to win this game. Hey, look on the bright side. At least Brett Bielema was four and one against Nebraska all time. So, yeah. Go. Well, Brett Bielema just lost his assistant uh, by the biggest amount he's ever lost in a Big Ten game. So, <laughs> I'm uh, a lot. The Illini fan base is, you know, super confident. I'm a big Brett Bielema homer, but I'm starting to have questions of whether Brett Bielema can adjust to the NIL times and the different, you know, more run and gun uh, times of today. So. I'm a little bit on edge. At least Vegas has hopes, and you know they they got Charles the favorite, so which blew my mind. I mean, I jumped on Nebraska plus one hundred and sixty so, so fast. <laughs> I do this thing called the happiness edge. Mm -hmm. Basically, I'm, I put my money on Nebraska because that way, if I have to watch the Illinois lose, I want to get paid. Money. I yeah, I, I want to get paid to be sad. So I like that's that. Always been kind of my strategy whenever Illinois is the favorite in the game. That might be new. Uh, my new strategy. I just avoided betting on Nebraska altogether. <laughs> I think I was in too much money betting with my heart and not with my head. So, yeah. I mean, I think Friday. I don't know what you guys think, but I think Friday is going to be a get-right game for one of our teams. Yeah. I just don't know which one. Um, it, if you take a look at our schedule, you know, we have Maryland coming up the following week, and that's going to be on national television. We're talking about NBC. 2.30, everyone's going to watch Maryland run, drop 50 on us. And you know that game leads into USC Notre Dame at night. If we lose on Friday, we're staring 0-4 in the Big Ten in the face. And, uh, you know, it's going to be tough. But if we win tomorrow, again, if you look at the rest of our schedule, you know, they're all, I'm not saying we're going to be favored, but they're winnable. So, yep. Sounds familiar. No, yeah. Neither, neither, neither school wants to be two and four after this yeah. game. And Nebraska going into bye week would be horrible. You know, sitting two and four out of that. So, but the difference is kind of at least Nebraska is, you know, a, a halfway through the first season with the first coach. The coach yeah. Whereas we're now in year three under Brett Bielema and, you know, we came off of eight wins last year and obviously, you know, we lost a lot of talent to the NFL over the last two seasons, but um, we're kind of in panic mode. Um, I thought, you know, our over under six and a half wins was a lock and now I'm not even sure we're going to beat Indiana and Purdue or not Purdue. We obviously lost to them uh, and Northwestern at the end of the year. And that's just a huge change of where my mindset was coming into the season yeah. compared to you guys. I so what's like, going wrong? Uh, how much time we got? Um, I Flame. think... <laughs> Six minutes. <laughs> Help us feel better. I think what it ultimately comes down to is Illinois obviously doesn't have the NIL funds that a, a school like Nebraska does. So Brett's strategy has been to re-recruit the guys that we have on our team and bring them back. You're talking about the Johnny Newtons who could have gone to the NFL last year. Keith Randolph could have gone to the NFL last year. Uh, Gabe Jackis, one of our uh, linebackers, was there's whispers some SEC teams were coming around to get him. What Brett's basically decided to do is to pay the guys that are already on the team, which is fine, but the issue is there are 12 players from the last two years on uh, Illinois roster that are now playing in the NFL. We're not Georgia. We're not Alabama. It's hard for us to reload that quickly and keep producing on the field. So for us, there's a huge gap. We still have some very good top end players uh, on our defense, on our offense. We have 
the best quarterback we've had in a very, very long time. But the bottom 11, the 11 worst starters we have are just right now not very good. Our offensive line is arguably, I would say, one of the five worst in the pow- all of Power 5. Every team is getting through, um, which is what makes me fear for Nebraska. With I saw your guys' sack numbers. Um, Luke is being forced. He's got maybe two seconds to throw the ball. The only guy who's catching balls is Isaiah Williams. The other two aren't really creating any sort of separation whatsoever. Our, you know, Johnny Newton, he's been a monster on defense and, you know, he's been showing up every day, but our, our, we had three secondary players who were drafted uh, in the top 70 picks in the NFL in April. And so when you look at our secondary now, like we've recruited the heck out of the, that, that position, but they're all young. And we saw this happen in the Purdue game, and it's been happening more and more. There's almost a given strategy that if it's third down, just toss it up in the air towards one of your wide receivers because one of our cornerbacks is going to make a costly mistake. Yeah, and, I, you know, we're one of the worst teams in the Big Ten with penalties. And honestly, I can keep going if this is a two-hour-long podcast because yeah. it's just problem after problem after problem, which – I think what it all boils down to is I never envisioned a Brett Bielema football team being sloppy, making, you know, uh, mental mistakes and being beaten on the lines, being beaten on the trenches. I mean, Purdue was beating us in the trenches. And like once I saw that, that's when all of a sudden I was even a couple of weeks ago, I still thought we were capable of winning eight games. So, after I saw Saturday, I've been humbled a little bit, demoralized a little bit. Now, you know, I'm kind of staring these problems straight in the face and trying to figure out if we can fix them for Friday night. Because, again, I think Friday is a huge, important game for this program. So, Sonny, you're telling me that it's a good thing that we waited a few days for you to have that discussion you wanted to have with me about ranking Illinois as the worst team in the Big Ten. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, we didn't have Sonny to. Sonny jumped on me last week for that, and he said, "We're going to talk about that next week." I said, "Okay." <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> the way you rank teams, I was just saying, resume-wise. Yeah, I, so- I, I thought for a time I had an argument, but you know, I'm going to go ahead, hand up, uh, wave the white white flag. You're you're catching me for now. Really downtime, Mark. <laughs> there. Yeah. With the uh, what what seems to be so I saw a stat that. Um, that Illinois is outside the top 100 in TFLs. Um, what what is what do you think is the biggest reason for for that? Because the defense was so solid last year. I know I know losing Ryan Walters and of course the three, you know, players to the NFL. But um, what is it about the TFLs? And and is it just not getting any? Is it a scheme thing or is it just a, you know, just getting no push or what is that? Yeah, I mean, that's again one of the glaring issues that we're wondering. We're not we're not even getting sacks. You know, some of the guys I mentioned before, uh, Gabe Jack is this was supposed to be his jump. Like this year was supposed to be the year that he made a leap to become known as the next Johnny Newton. Yeah. But you know, with the defensive changes um, over the off season, we Brett had to hire like Ryan Walters took a few members of the staff with him to Purdue, and the linebackers coach was one of them. And we hired a, a former Arizona Cardinals. Um, oh, <laughs> yeah, that probably was a <laughs> red flag number one. But he was, like, I think, believe their defensive line coach, and uh, he was re- he's been recruiting the heck out of summer. But a lot of us are questioning, like Keith Randolph, a very good player, but he's, he doesn't have the sack numbers that he should be having. We're we're not getting the pressure on other teams that we have been doing that we were doing in years previous. And this time we no longer have the talent in the secondary to make up for it. You know, last year we had, you know, uh, Sidney Brown, obviously Devin Weatherspoon, like made a, himself a household name last night. Um, we had we had three really good players back there who could, you know, help you out if the defensive line didn't make a mistake. Now, if the defense is not getting any pressure, any quarterback who's worth his weight can wait it out you know, make a quick throw because the guys on our defense are just nobody showing up. It's I'm perplexed. Well, this is your week, buddy. 
you know, it's so funny. Like I want to say the same thing to you guys. It's, it's one of those where I'm not looking forward to Friday. And like, I haven't had this feeling since the lovey era, like lovey era, you know, it was just, it was a different kind of hurt because the lovey era, we knew we were outmanned every single week. We knew we didn't have the coaching. Lovey stopped coaching the our recruiting the state of Illinois. So we knew week in, week out, like, okay, we don't stand a chance. I'm just watching them because I'm an Illinois fan. It hurts a little bit more now because, you know, I had such high hopes and I'm genuinely perplexed because I think we have the coaching. We have some good high-end talent there. And it's just, it's not enough to make for the (laughs) glaring holes that we have, mainly on the offensive line, because that's what's just, I mean, you guys are going to see it firsthand Friday. Um, every game is the same same tape over and over again. You guys are going to be able to rush the quarterback. And if you guys jump to a, a two-score lead, then uh, the game plan is essentially over because now the game's, the whole game plan revolves around Luke Altmaier. But Luke is a young quarterback. He's only played in six games at, at this point. He knows he has zero offensive line, so he's got a second and a half, two seconds to make a move. And... Uh, you know, he forces throws, and when he forces throws, you saw what happened against uh, Penn State. It's it's tough. He, uh, you know, we're at the point where now where we've got some decent young players who, you know, are were more highly rated, and I think it's time that Brett, I think one of the adjustments he's going to make Friday is to give them some more play. You know, our, our upperclassmen wide receivers just can't create any space outside Isaiah Williams, and so we have a young guy named Malik Elzey who's just, you watch him, his footage on YouTube, he looks like he's a man among kids. I really think that there's a chance that this becomes the Malik LZ game on Friday for us to have any chance of winning. Hey, somebody tell Mike Fort that nobody on the show predicted Nebraska to beat Michigan last week. So I don't know where you got that from. So your insecurities are showing. Go to, go to the Michigan channel. What did I say when you asked me what kind of chance they had to win? Zero. Right. You might have had negative if I yeah. if, if if zero wasn't it, it probably would have went negative. You were very confident in that zero. Oh yeah, I did not hesitate. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's um yeah, with with y'all that's that's gonna be a big key is like and and shoot too, just um you know, with us having a, a defensive back, you know, out, it's gonna be interesting to see if um you know y'all maybe try to target that or, you know, y'all's approach to kind of scheming that with the little movement and defense because um, we did have to move somebody over to safety and fill in our backup jack position. So a little bit of a, a shifting at the defensive back uh, position. But, yeah, it's Illinois has been, um, you know, what are they, top 50 in passing. It's been it's been a lot of, uh, a lot of passing game script this year. So, yeah. Um, you know, at least it's uh, it's something that kind of doesn't play in. You know, the Nebraska's run defense has been the strength, but um, you know, it's going to be obvious passing downs, and our, our defensive backs are really going to have to be ready this week. And with the with the movement, and then the you know the loss of some depth there, um, I'm interested to see how that kind of plays out and how y'all maybe attack that. Um, is there any indication that y'all may try to attack the weak spot in or? "Quote unquote weak spot with the movement and the injuries there, or or what seems to be the kind of the uh, the approach this week um, from the team, or that they indicated." You know, it's I've been watching all the press conferences, and there's definitely a sense of urgency of trying to find an identity of what this offense is supposed to look like. Yeah. So. I mean, I'm not a I'm not an X's and O's guy myself. The only mm-hmm. thing I can think of is Brett's going to have to. Again, the offensive line is the biggest issue, so I think we may have to go more into a twelve formation. Mm-hmm. You know, let two tight bring in two tight ends on the right hand side to try to give Luke a little bit more time. Yeah. Um, our freshman running, but true freshman running back, had a great game last week. Um, you know, try to give him some run. It's it's going to all come down to protecting the quarterback. I think if we do that, again, we have some decent weapons, mm-hmm. especially Isaiah Williams, who's, you know, you know, I feel like he's been 
uh, at Illinois for a very long time now. But How many have they we, had now? Like five? Yeah, we're on number three now. <laughs> we're on number three in the last, what, 20 years or so. It's uh, – it's a, there's it's a only, good luck of there's an only one juice though right yeah. yeah oh yeah okay absolutely that's really right yeah. but um juice so, I, so i'm curious like uh, what's the game script you know again my prediction for friday is going to be 31 13. i have no idea which team has 31. i have no idea which oh. team has 13. <laughs> I, I think it's a get right game for one of them yeah let's say nebraska is the one with 31. what's the game script for that to happen Run the ball. Run the ball, yeah. It's going to be a whole lot of um, just getting big, getting physical, and just trying to wear the defense, wear y'all's defense down. Yeah, and everybody knows Nebraska that wants to run. So. Yep. It's going to just wear, wear y'all's, trying to wear y'all's defensive That's line down. And then maybe, you know, because just in the past game, you know, we we really don't, uh, you know, Billy Kemp is our, our one receiver right now, but we don't have a true one receiver that, um, I feel like we're comfortable targeting. You know, Michigan did a good job of taking our tight ends out of the game because Fedoni is a big target. You know, Borkature is a big target. But um, they did a very good job of taking them out of the game. And, you know, it was Billy Kemp and not a whole lot outside of that. But, uh, you know, Marcus Washington, again, you know, he had a play that could have busted uh, for a touchdown, but that was just one play. So we need to get a lot more consistency in the past game before that ever becomes our recipe for a win or any part of our game plan coming into the game because it seems like every time we try to pass, um, you know, for instance, against Colorado, we were passed a little bit more than I'd like, you know, out of shotgun and stuff like that. And even those errors out of shotgun have forced us to not be able to get in shotgun as much as we want to. And just, yeah, it's just the, the way that we're going to make the less mistakes right now seems to just be getting big and running the ball. And Nebraska is already, you know, they're preparing for a physical game. Yeah. Up front, you know, and they've already had two physical practices this week with yeah. another one coming tomorrow. So um, yeah. they're, they're getting ready for a battle in the trenches. I know you guys are a really passionate fan base. Like, I know it's just year one, but is there any sort of sense of panic from the, from you guys with Met Rule? No. I basically, for me, I'd reset my patience meter, you know. To, I think a lot of what the impatience is is a carryover from Frost uh, and people, you know, being patient for that amount of time. And when we went and got Rule, they kind of never reset that and they wanted a first year turnaround. But looking at Rule's history, it's never a one year turnaround. You know, you usually struggle in year one and then years two and three, you start to see the fruits of the labor pay off. We've been um, patient for the last 20 years. Well, that's true. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's true, but again, with each with each time, we do have to reset that and and understand that it's a different you know it's a whole different thing. We got to look back to week four under Frost. You know, week four under Frost, he was zero four. You know, we didn't win until Minnesota in week what we were zero six, week seven. So and nobody was throwing the panic alarms in. So I think we need to have that same approach here and understand that you know we're not zero four. You know, so. Um, the, the big jump that we need to see, the, the time where we should panic is if there's no improvement between year one and two and if there's minimal improvement between year two and three. Um, but I don't expect that. I, I fully trust Rule to, to get it right. And, you know, um, that's all we can do. You know, I just it's just it's just a matter of patience. We, we knew this roster wasn't going to be ready to compete for the Big Ten West for a couple years. So nothing's changed there. What I'm curious about is, what kind of an Illinois crowd is going to show up there on a Friday night in Champaign, Urbana? How much interest is there going to be? I mean, it'll be 70 30 red at this point. You know, Illinois is very much uh, a bandwagon fan base. Um, they're pretty rabid when it comes to their basketball team, but it's kind mm -hmm. of because the basketball team is historically a much better program. The, uh, you know, had they won against Purdue, I think, you know, it would have been a sellout Friday night. Um, moving forward, we're looking at, you know, probably 40, 45,000 people in the stands, which, you know, and that's if we beat Nebraska. If, if we lose in Nebraska, now you're talking about, you know, the lovey numbers, again, uh, attendance wise, just because, um, you know, we don't have the rabidness, you know, that other fan bases uh, like you guys have. So, I mean, again, that's also why I'm worried about Friday night. You know, it's going to be on TV. Um, 
as Mark said, not everyone's or not everyone's going to be watching it, but you know, so it's going to be on a lot of TVs at least. And so that first time that Nebraska gets a key sack and all of a sudden you hear the crowd roar, you know, for a Nebraska sack, I think there's a chance that, you know, that could be pretty demoralizing for you know some of the players on the field. And I'm just hoping that, you know, they're mentally strong enough to, you know, bounce back. Yeah, essentially um, what it's going to come down to, and I was thinking this just because Nebraska has been slow starting this year is probably Illinois just needs to come out and they would have to just get off, take advantage of that and, and start early, get their crowd into the game, try to take our crowd out of the game. And then, that way, when you know our offense has been kind of finding a rhythm late in the second, you know, and then the, into the second half, um, that's I think that's Illinois' opportunity to try to just establish some kind of a, a lead or something to get their crowd into the game and keep them there. And then that way, when we turn it up later, maybe you know they're in a much better position. So I, I do think that first quarter is going to be very indicative, um, just based on how we've started this season of uh, the outcome. It's funny you say that because, you know, if that is the case, then we're in big trouble because Illinois hasn't started off strong in a single game this year. Yeah. You know, we were down to Toledo, we were down to Toledo in our first game. Mm -hmm. um, Kansas, you know, ran us off the field in that first half. Um, ironically enough, we kept it pretty close with Penn State for two and a half quarters. But, I was surprised by that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, you know, yeah, we had a good, you know, our quarterback just had the worst game of his life. Um, but us jumping out to leads is just it hasn't happened all season long um, yeah. even against florida atlantic two weeks ago you know uh we were down 10 nothing in the first quarter so yeah. if that's what it takes for us to win on friday then i'm feeling really good about the plus 160 i have on nebraska <laughs> is that florida atlantic game the, the game that casey thompson got hurt in? no he got uh, hurt the week before okay <laughs> yeah. Yeah. here's a news alert for you Listen to this one, Greg. Oh. According to this report, it was in August of 2023. For the first time, the most carried cable sports network in the United States no is way. FS1. No way. Per oh, the he sports that he dug that up. Come per on. I don't even know what channel it's on. <laughs> per Sports Business Journal, Nielsen's latest estimates indicate that FS1 is now in 71.3 million households which is down from 73.9 in January. Despite the drop, FS1 is edged ahead of ESPN, wow. which now is That's in 71.3 million households. In January, ESPN was in 74.1, so they've lost almost 3 million homes since January. Oh, what so, a shame. so surprised that ESPN is losing all, viewers. It's all the people wow. watching all the, uh, the Grand Prix motor racing shows on FS1. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that you know that's why, and this is a topic maybe for another day. But I, think I didn't expect to find that. By the way, when I looked that up, I was just I'm curious sure. what the numbers were. But we discussed this before, like that. you know, that's why I think the Big Ten has kind of set itself in such a promising position with that media deal that they have moving forward with CBS, uh, Fox, and uh, NBC. Yeah, just because we got three conglomerates who are going to be working and collaborating together. Whereas SECs pretty much aligned themselves with ESPN, which Disney's almost at this point dying to sell. And, you know, they're facing massive layoffs. So, you know, moving forward, um, you know, I, I really like the way our conference has positioned itself. Yeah, ESPN's quality hasn't improved in years. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, that's a dying, you know, dying brand there. And then also the visibility of having the three you know, big spots for the games on Saturdays is going to be huge, whereas ESPN is going to be filtered through ESPNU and ESPN Plus on a lot of those games. So, Well, I mean, it's kind of ironic because my boss was talking to me the other day about, you know, he asked uh, if I could slip some highlights in on some of our productions hmm. like I used to. And I'm like, I don't even want to tempt fate, you know, because – now, we're not just dealing with the Big Ten Network anymore. We're dealing with CBS. We're dealing yeah. with DC. We're dealing with Fox. And, um, you know, they I won't mean, take it easy. They have sent, you know, they sent out an email last season, halfway through the season, because I was still using all game highlights. Yeah. And they gave you a warning that if you keep using it, your credential gets pulled. Yeah. 
they, you know, they don't miss things either. Yeah, and there's so, so many more eyes. That's that's my point. Is that there's so many more eyes on it now that uh, somebody doesn't like me, uh, they could make a complaint. And boom, I'd be done. So they probably even got bots out there. Rules. <laughs> they probably even got bots out there that like. Oh, sure they do. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> So, yeah, unless you're paying their their fee to use to run highlights, you know they're gonna they're gonna nail you. Yeah, but no, that's that's a great that's a great um, point there with the with the visibility and, and just the money from those networks as well. Yeah. So that's what you know. You can put all their eggs in one basket with the SEC and now see what it's getting them. So. Mm-hmm. So you, you see a lot of people on Twitter, especially this week, complaining about, you know, uh, I think Illinois has like three games on Peacock this season, and there's a substantial amount of basketball games that are on Peacock. And we, we kind of talked about it like that's just kind of reality moving forward. I yeah. mean, these, these networks paid a lot of money for our conference. We're going to have to fork out the, you know, five bucks a month or whatever uh, Peacock costs. Uh, yeah, I already subscribed to Peacock so I can see the Tour de France. So Yeah, that's just the nature of the beast as it is. <laughs> Everything's going to kind of like an a la carte type of, you know, system where you just pay a little bit for each streaming service, you know, getting yeah, to that point quickly. It's funny. Like, you know, I, I just bring, we bring up the fact that, hey, look at our program, Illinois. Not historically a powerhouse in any mm-hmm. sort of way, but we're going to be making more money every single year than a lot of the powers that in the ACC so much so that those schools are begging to get out of their deals and join ours. So it's, you know, one of those things where we can complain, but I don't think we would have it any other way because, you know, at least Illinois for the short future with college football now and the way TV dictates everything's, you know, 10, 15, 20 years down the line, who knows, but at least for the next decade or so, Illinois has to count their lucky stars that they're one of the founding members of the Big Ten. Uh, yeah, you're, and you're, so they're kind of safe. Yeah, you're in a conference now that's coast to coast, too. So yep. you got eyeballs on it all the way across the country. Mm-hmm. But, you know, traditional schools that were never Big Ten fans, now they're forced to be Big Ten fans. So, yeah, they, they were, Big Ten was very smart putting this all together. Mm hmm. Now the question is, what is Illinois going to do with that money? <laughs> well, hopefully, spend a little bit on that NIL. Um, <laughs> you know, our facilities are actually top notch now. Uh, that was one of the things that our AD, who's fantastic, Josh Whitman, um, he made a major focus on. So the facilities are there. Um, you know, it's the adjustments you have to make now is you don't want to be considered a stepping stone program. Uh, you have to have that conversation with Brett, you know, Hey, the NIL, we gotta, we gotta reload every single year now. You know, we, we can't, we're not the type of program where, and you know, Brett historically, yeah, he's been successful at Wisconsin, but he was still averaging. I think I read like the 35, the 35th best recruiting class. Mm. You know, it's not like he was, recruiting studs year in and year out he just had three stars and he developed them into good football players yeah it doesn't necessarily it's not going to work now and especially it's not going to work now or next year when wisconsin's in the league when or sorry uh washington's in the league when oregon's in the league usc like these are guys who are recruiting four and five stars every single year yep. and so not that our goal is even remotely to be at that level but there's no reason – like, Illinois has a better recruiting base than Iowa does, than Minnesota, than Wisconsin. Like, the football players, the high school football in Illinois, it's just constantly being poached by the schools around it because we've just never had any sort of identity or, you know, or any sort of success uh, in the long run. If we can recruit, you know, kind of the base from here – I know we're, gonna, we're never going to out-recruit new Notre Dame or mm-hmm. some of the big schools. That, that That's not what I'm asking. Yeah. But, you know, Lovey basically, he, his last recruiting season at Illinois, he had like 23 recruits and zero, zero were from the state of Illinois. Yeah. Crazy. And so, Crazy. you know, it, it's one of those, you know, in the new new Big Ten, you know, if we can just steadily reach bowls, bowl games every single year, mm-hmm. You know, for a, for a while, I'll be very content with that. Eventually, you know, you get a little hungrier and you get a little more thirsty and you want to 
move to levels beyond that. But um, I think now we're very fortunate that there is a difference between Illinois and the $60 million that they're going to be getting every single year to upgrade our program as opposed to, you know, some of the other top teams and some of the other conferences who are getting 35 million, $40 million. Like we have a 33% more money coming in. So let's, let's, you know, make use of that. Yeah, for sure. And uh, anything else for Sonny? No, man, I actually really appreciate it, man. You came on here and, uh, you know, you made us feel good about ourselves. No, I'm just kidding. But, <laughs> but no, I hope you win. I really hope you win some money. Um, <laughs> no, I really, way. I really yeah. appreciate you coming on, man. Yeah. So that was very insightful. Thank you. No, thanks for inviting me on, and uh, you know, hopefully, we can reconnect sometime soon. Which I wish you luck beyond this season. But by the way, I wish Lovey was still the coach of the Bears. Of the Bears. Oh, yeah. yeah. He got, well, I mean, he pretty much retired at that point. But like he, he, he collected right. money from the University of Illinois after that, but you know, he you was pretty much retired once he was done with the Bears. I'm the best a thing he did at Illinois mm. was grow that beard. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, the Lovey beard. Lovey got us. Lovey got the Texans CJ Stroud, so I'm forever indebted to him because he won that. Well, he got us. Or you know, I'm a Bears fan. He got the Bears the number one overall pick. So you know, yeah. I, I, I hold no ill towards Lovey. Just yeah. Well, he's the best getting, Bears coach of my lifetime, but he's also the worst Illinois coach of my lifetime. Y'all getting that first pick set the Texans up with uh, the second to get Stroud, so I am mm -hmm. forever and indebted to him. Now the Bears are going to get the first two this year, so yeah, yeah. Caleb yeah. doesn't matter. We don't have the coaches to do anything with it, so got to fire Eberflus. Eberflus. Well, I feel like an idiot for buying Sunday ticket, so. <laughs> I have a Justin Fields autographed jersey hanging on my wall, so it's like I still like Justin Fields. I, mean, I love Justin Fields. I, I love, love you know, him. I so, can't wait for him to be on a different team and, yeah. and you know just crazy. completely becoming a Pro Bowl player. But it's just our team is so broken, our coaching yeah. staff is so broken that you know it doesn't matter if we draft Caleb Williams next year because yeah. we're just going to go through the same cycle four years from now. So after the the Nebraska Michigan game, as we were wrapping up on the field you know, with our stand-ups and everything. Um, the local CBS, the Lincoln CBS uh, sports anchor or sports uh, director, he's a Bears fan too. And he was uh, walking by and he's like, Greg, 10-11 uh, made the change and uh, decided to show the Bills and the Dolphins game instead of the Bears and Broncos game, which uh, CBS has always been owned by, you know, the Broncos have been their bread and butter. And the Chiefs and the Broncos, and uh, I'm you know, the and the Bears are pretty much the local team here for the Fox affiliate. So, yeah, for them to pull that game was just incredible to me. <laughs> People, the last time the Bears won an NFL football game was October twenty four. Yeah, it's pretty two thousand twenty two. Pretty. Wow. The last time the Texans won back to back games was twenty twenty one. So. The Chicago Bears live on Tuesday. <laughs> but um, no, Justin Fields, people That's forget it. just how good he was at Ohio State, especially in that Clemson game. Like, the dude can throw the ball. And I went to Nebraska Ohio State game when game day was there, and he looked like a man amongst boys out there on the field. He was just oh, yeah. bigger, faster, and stronger than everybody. So, my wife is actually an Ohio State alum. So, I always have like a, a soft spot for Ohio State. They're usually on my second TV. So, when we traded up to draft Justin Fields. I had been wa I've watched every snap of his entire Ohio State career. I thought that made me genuinely very excited. I thought oh, it was I a deal. Yeah. Which is what makes me so again demoralized, mm -hmm. you know, now seeing what he's kind of regressed to and like just not giving having the opportunities to be what I genuinely feel like I know he can become. Yeah. This idiot, I mean, this idiot has him as his quarterback on two of his three fantasy teams. Yeah. So. I should just stop watching football between the Bears and the <laughs> Illinois football. I don't know what I'm doing. I got to find get into soccer or something. Hey, Greg, I think you need to tune into my podcast then. Yeah, I hope you, I hope you not draft Justin Fields next time. <laughs> that was drafting by the heart. <laughs> That's uh, where the money's made by other people. Uh, they're counting on everybody else drafting with their hearts. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Sonny. Appreciate you being here. Everybody check out uh, Sonny's uh, show right here on YouTube. It's Illini Cast. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, there's the uh, Twitter handle as well. Or shoot your follow. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Thank Sonny. Appreciate it. Have a good one. Bye-bye. All right. Yes, it should be quite the struggle on Friday night between these two. Yeah, I'm, um, you know, I, I feel like I have a little more confidence um, in us than probably he does in Illinois, which is, which is, I get it. Cause like he said, they're, they're in, they're in year three under their coach. So they're expecting, of course, to be much a further ahead where they are now. But I just think maybe right now this might just come down to Nebraska, just having uh, more talent on the field. And, you know, just, I think uh, overall rule, I think is just, you know, I think I think he's got this team trending up, and I don't know if Illinois has an identity right now, and I think that's going to make a big difference on Friday. Yeah. No, I won't even be watching the game. I, I'm going to be doing a high school game Friday night. So. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, guys. Anything else? No. We go big red. Damage? We need this. Uh, we need this win Friday. So let's. Uh, Hopefully, you know, join me in the post game after the win, guys. There it is. Post game with Justin right after the game on this channel right here. You guys know where to find us. Find Justin right after uh, Nebraska, Illinois, and make it on back here next Tuesday. And many of you jumping in here late, you can just watch the rest of the show right now. So for Justin, for Greg, appreciate these two. We will see you all back here next Tuesday. Peace.